Welcome to part 15 of this Davon Data tutorial series, a Python crash course. This is the last video in my Python crash course series and covers a very important topic, visualizing your data. In my hands-on analytics and data science work, I spend a lot of time visualizing my data, and there's no better way to do that in Python than to use the mighty Plot9 library. So I need to start real quick with some housekeeping. First thing you need to know is you need to get the CSV files. This particular Plot9 tutorial uses data files built or extracted from Microsoft's AdventureWorks DW sample database. If you need to get the files, let's say you haven't got the files from the previous video in this series, the link to the GitHub is in the description below this video. Now next up, this video is long. It's approaching an hour. So I didn't do a lot of editing. And that's simply because it just takes me so much time to edit a video. So hopefully, even though there's minimal editing in this video, you still find the content useful. And then lastly, and most importantly, this tutorial is specifically designed for you to follow along. Please type the code as I type it, because you learn Python by writing Python. Okay, something you need to know about data visualization with Plot9. First up, Plot9, the library, is a port of something known as ggplot2. ggplot2 was a data visualization library that was created for the R programming language originally. And quite simply, as I'll say later on, ggplot2 is simply awesome. So this is a good thing that it got ported to Python, because compared to things like matplotlib and seaborn, ggplot2 just totally kicks butt. So if you want to learn more about ggplot2, you can get this book right here. This book is available freely online. It is in the R programming language. However, the actual code looks basically the same. The guys that created Plot9 did a very, very good job of doing a port directly over. So if you want to learn more about ggplot2, you can get this free online book. Or of course, you can also Google or use ChatGPT as well. If you're more interested in general around visual data analysis, this is how you actually create the visualizations. But this book up here will actually teach you more about how to visually analyze data. And it's a book called Now You See It by Stephen Few. Love these two books. You can see them, picture here of them on my dining room table. I obviously own physical copies. I have no financial stake in recommending these books whatsoever, just that they're great. If you're interested in visual data analysis using Plot9, you can't go wrong buying this book and then maybe getting the online copy of this. All right, so here we are in the notebook. And this code here is pretty standard. I covered it in the previous video, part 14 of the series. If you need to, go ahead and pause the video to type in this code if you're starting from scratch, or alternatively, you can download the file from the GitHub. Okay, so what we've got here is our data. So this data is based on Microsoft's AdventureWorks DW sample database. And what we can see here is we have reseller sales, which is our sales data, line item sales data, or resellers, which is data about bike shops and the folks that resell AdventureWorks products and then our products data. So we're just gonna load these all up. And notice we're also going to load up our dates in our reseller sales data frame as pandas date time objects, or I should say Python date time objects. Okay, so that code just loads up the raw CSVs, but eh, we actually need to do a little bit more. So as was covered in the previous video in the series, we're gonna do some data wrangling. So you can see the data wrangling code here. I'm adding some features. I'm then extracting some date features so on and so forth. And moving on, we're gonna do date wrangling to the resellers data. We're gonna do some data wrangling to the products data. And we're just gonna get our raw data set up for analysis. And then lastly, what we're gonna do, and we cover this in part 14 of the series, is we're gonna join everything up. What we're gonna do is we're going to take our line item sales data, our wrangled products data, and then lastly, we're going to merge it or interjoin it with our resellers. And in particular, what we saw in the last video is we're going to limit our analysis, our visualizations to these particular criteria. So annual revenue of greater than or equal to 150,000 per year, number of employees greater or equal to 35, and resellers that are located in Canada and the United States. As I covered in the previous video, the idea here is we're trying to identify things that are going on with our largest resellers so that we can actually say, hey, business development folks, sales folks, go out and find more customers like this, more resellers like this. And what we're gonna do here, once we got all this done, is start doing some visualizations. 
And this is more of an exploratory process. This is trying to understand what's going on with these large resellers. And in particular, what we're going to do is use a library called Plot9, as I discussed in the intro. Plot9 is my preferred library for doing data visualizations in Python. I use it whenever I can. And the reason for this is simple. Plot9 is a port, as I mentioned in the intro, of ggplot2, which is the de facto standard data visualization library in the R programming language. And ggplot2, simply put, is awesome. And plot9 is awesome because it's based on ggplot2. It's way better than matplotlib or seaborn or anything else you can use in, in Python, in my opinion. So we're going to start doing some numeric visualizations of our data here. So first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to start taking a look at our profit. So we created a feature called profit. So what we need to do is import a series of functions from plot9. So from plot9, I'm going to import ggplot, themebw, geom histogram, histogram, hopefully I'm spelling that correctly. <laughs> no, I'm not. Histogram and AES. And I'll explain what all these things mean as we start building up the visualization. So what we're going to do is we're going to visualize the profit distribution. Because we have in our data frame a column, distri, dist, oh my goodness, distribution, <laughs> there we go. Nope, that's not right either. There we go, distribution. So we have a column in our data frame called profit, and it's got a bunch of numbers in it, about 28,000-ish numbers. And what we want to do is actually take a look at how are those numbers distributed? Are they all close to zero? Are they all really high? Are they all really negative? That sort of thing. That's We want to characterize what what's going on with our profit column, essentially. So what we're going to do is we're going to use method chaining here. And what we're going to think about as we build our visualizations with plot nine is a metaphor, an analogy, and that is creating a painting. So for example, I'm a big fan of this guy named Bob Ross. If you don't know who he, know who he is, pause the video, do a quick YouTube search, watch some videos of Bob Ross. He's a cultural icon. <laughs> He's awesome. But he taught people how to paint. And what he would do is he would show you how to do your painting by breaking it down by layer by layer. So you'd start with the base canvas, and then you'd put some... Uh, titanium white on it maybe as they would say and then you'd put a happy little mountain on there and then maybe some happy clouds and so on and so forth so we want to think of that as our metaphor as our analogy as we work with plot nine what we're doing is we are building a series of layers that eventually results in a painting or our data visualization so first up using this painting analogy what we want to do is set up our canvas and we do that by using the ggplot function the ggplot function is the base idea. And what we do is we say, hey, we've got a canvas. And by the way, we're going to have some paints that we're going to use. And the paints that we're going to use for our painting are located in a data frame. So large resellers, which is our data frame, our merged up data frame of all of our product data, all of our Canadian and United and US resellers and their associated sales, that's our collection of paints that we can use to create our painting. So what we're going to do is we use this plus symbol. We use this operator to say, look, we're going to compose, we're going to layer on various aspects of our painting until we get to the final result. And then we say, okay, cool. One, two, three. One of the things I can do is I can determine what my base canvas looks like. And I am a big fan of simplicity. So I use something called theme BW. Theme Beam W just basically tells Plot9, hey, I would like my canvas to be just black and white. Very simple. Don't, you, don't put any fancy shading on it. Don't do anything like that. If I want more colors, I will add them myself. So Theme BW gives us a nice, simple canvas to operate on. And then what I can say is, all right, on top of this, what do I want to draw? So I've got my base canvas. I got my paints. What do I want to draw? What do I want to paint on my painting? And what I want to do is I want to create a histogram. And I don't have time in this video to explain how histograms work. You can certainly pause the video, do a quick YouTube or Google on histograms. Most people have seen them in some form or another. Maybe that was in a statistics class back in the day. Histograms are actually relatively intuitive. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say, all right, I'm going to build a histogram. That's the kind of painting that I want. 
This is the kind of layer that I want. I can actually layer multiple things, by the way, in my visualizations, and we'll see this later on. But for right now, let's just think about creating a histogram painting. And what we need to do is we need to say, okay, look, when we build this painting, we need to map the various aspects of the visualization to the paints that we have at our disposal. And once again, the paints are essentially the features, the columns, and our data frame. So we call this mapping. And what we can do is we can create something called an aesthetic. And an aesthetic essentially is just a Python object that maps various aspects of our paints to how the painting is going to look. So that's a bit abstract. So we're gonna use AES, which is a function for creating an aesthetic. And we're gonna say, look, a histogram only works with one paint or one column or one feature in our data frame. And that's on the x-axis. And we can say, hey, I want you to paint my histogram using the profit feature or the profit column. Now, if I run this, it'll take a second. And large resellers is not defined because guess what I forgot to do? I forgot to run the code. My apologies. Hopefully by now you uh, are used to me making mistakes. <laughs> Okay, now we've got our data frame. And now I can run this, and what'll end up happening is I'll get a warning from Plot9. It says, hey, Dave, look, I had to infer some stuff. I had to guess how you want the painting to look because you didn't specify what a bin width, what bin width you wanted to use. So I just made my best guess. It gives me a warning, and then it produces this visualization. And what we can see here is a histogram. And it's a little hard to see, not surprisingly. And the reason for that is, is because these little bars here correspond to what are known as bins or buckets. It's a way to count up uh, the, the numeric values. So let's go actually, let's actually copy this code here. And let's paste it down here. And let's actually specify a bin width. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make my bin widths equal to a hundred, hundred dollars. So my profit column essentially is measured in dollars. Negative amounts means that I lost money on a particular sales order line item. Profit and positive numbers mean I made money, I made profit. And what this is saying is, hey, look, create buckets that are about a hundred dollars wide. So basically it's say like everything from negative 50 up to a 50, up to 50 bucks, that would be a bin width of a hundred, right? because we're going both positive and negative. Zero would mean I made no profit at all, I just broke even. So I go from negative 50 to one up to 50. And then what do I do is I say, look, every value of profit that's between negative 50 and 50, I stick in this bin and I count them up and that shows how high my bars are. So if I run this, what we can see now is a little bit easier histogram to look at. And what we can see here is my bin centered on zero or breaking even is super, super high. And what that tells me is, is that most of my individual sales order line items from the reseller sales original data for my large resellers in the US and Canada, they're all between probably like negative 50 to 50 bucks. So I'm making, I'm not making a lot of money in general because you can see here, the height of this bar dominates everything else. And what we can see here is my more profitable stuff is over here and the bars are very, very short, which means I don't have many rows of data with profit in this particular range. Now, because we've got a lot of values and because things range wildly, you can't really see, but I probably have some sales order line items that are extremely negative. That's the reason why I see this skewed distribution over here, right? I don't see any lines, but that's because simply because they're too short for me to see. But I have stuff like negative $10,000 or negative $15,000 or somewhere around here. That's in the range. So another visualization that we can use to help us understand what's going on is what's known as a box plot. And I'm going to make some more cells here. And let's take a look at the box plot. Okay. So we're going to need to import from plot nine another function. box plot, okay? And we're gonna visualize the profit distribution. So we're gonna do conceptually something that we did similar to what we did in the previous slide using a histogram, or previous visualization, excuse me, using a histogram. 
But now we're going to say, look, we're going to visualize the profit distribution, but we're also going to put in a second feature, a second paint, if you will. And we're going to use promotion category. Because what we have saw already is, hey, look, um, our stuff isn't wi as wildly profitable as we thought. <laughs> this histogram is shows most of the stuff is like not very profitable. Most of the sales order line items are not very profitable. So let's see if there's maybe something related to promotions. This is something I've commonly see in the real world where a lot of organizations will try and juice revenues, juice sales by using promotions and discounts, sometimes excessively so, and they actually shoot themselves in the foot in terms of profitability. So we can take a look at this and say, okay, is that what's going on? And once again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, GG plot. We want to build a canvas. We're going to build a new painting using the large resellers data frame for our paints. And then one, two, three, we're going to use theme BW again, because that's just the way I roll. Your mileage may vary. And we're going to use GM box plot now. Now I don't have time to fully explain how to read a box plot. Go ahead and pause the video, search on YouTube, Google it. They're pretty useful. Now we always need an aesthetic when we're building our visualizations, always, always, always. Now you might be thinking, geez, Dave, this is a lot of typing. And the answer is actually not as much as you might think, because as we'll see later on, once you start building your visualizations in Blot9, you end up just copying and pasting the code a lot and just tweaking it a little bit. So it's not as much typing as you might think. So we're gonna go ahead and say, look, on our X axis, we're gonna put promotion category. That's our first paint. And then our second paint is going to be profit. Now, if I run this, and if I haven't typed it in correctly, what we can see here now is an awesome visualization where we have our promotion categories here, no discount and resellers. Those are our two large buckets for our promotion categories. And what we can see here is, whoo, well, even when we offer no discount whatsoever, these dots here are outliers. So we do have some negative values, but mostly we are either breaking even or making a profit because notice that the, the box is pretty thin, not very tall, but it is all higher than zero, which is good. Now compare that to when we're actually having reseller sales, sales order line items, individual line items on our sales orders that have the promotion category reseller. Notice that the box dips below, mostly below zero. And what we can see here is a lot of dots going and notice that we actually have a dot close to negative 15,000, <laughs> which means we've had, we have a sales order line item with a reseller promotion category where we lost almost $15,000 on that line item. Now this is super interesting, very, very interesting. And this was easy to create and let's go ahead and make things a little bit better by making this a little bit bigger. So notice here what I'm doing. I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste in the code here. And what I'm gonna do is from plot nine, import theme. And theme is another function in plot nine that allows you to control the look of the visualization. And just so that we're crystal clear on this, plot nine, like I said, is based on ggplot2. GGplot2 was originally designed to create print quality visualizations, for example, things that you might see in a scientific journal. So if you're asking yourself, hey, Dave, can I do X or can I do Y or can I do Z with my Plot9 visualizations? Usually the answer is yes. What you'll need to do is either Google what you need to do if you're trying to do something fancy or maybe use ChatGPT to help you out. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and modify this code a little bit. Notice how I copy and pasted it. And I'm gonna add theme. And what I'm gonna do here is use a parameter called figure size. And that allows me to control how big the visualization is. So I'm gonna make it 10 inches wide and six inches tall. And then if I run this, what I get is a little bit larger visualization that's a little bit easier to see. Okay, so you, that's how you can start composing and building the layers. Notice what we're doing here, right? We start with our bare canvas and we got our paints. We specify how we want the canvas to look. We specify that we want a box plot painting. And then we add another layer that says, look, this is how big we want the canvas to be. And you might be asking yourself, does it matter what order these things are in? 
And generally the answer is no. The only time that that might be a problem is if you're layering different types of paintings on top of each other and you might obscure one of the lower layers with a higher layer, just like if you were painting a real painting and you say you have a happy little mountain on your painting and you draw a house on top of the mountain. You won't be able to see all the mountain anymore. Same idea. All right. So I use histograms in box plots all the time in my real world analytics and data science. Another visualization that I use a lot is what's known as a scatter plot. And that allows me to actually look at two numeric columns, two numeric features, two paints in our metaphor simultaneously. So what I'm gonna do is create a scatter plot. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, cool. I noticed that promotions seem to be correlated or associated with unprofitable sales order line items, right? As we can see here. So let's talk about the discount amount. So a promotion category is gonna be obviously related to some sort of discount. So we're, we have some discounts that are high, some discounts that are low, so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we're gonna do is from plot nine, we're going to go ahead and import geom point. This is the type of painting that creates a scatter plot. So we're gonna visualize the relationship between profit, oh, let's make that capital, profit and discount amount using a scatter plot. Okay. ggplot, large resellers, theme BW. And once again, of course, you could be like, Dave, why don't you copy and paste reuse? Well, you certainly could. But for some reason, I'm being kooky today. Mapping equals AES, right, or aesthetic. Once again, we're going to say, hey, what paint do we want on the x-axis of our scatter plot painting? And we say, hey, we want discount amount. And then on the y-axis, we're going to put profit. And then I'm going to go ahead and use my theme. So I can... Control the size. We're gonna make it once again, 10 inches wide and six inches tall. Now you might be asking yourself, hey Dave, how did you pick discount amount on the X axis and profit on the Y axis? Doesn't matter, you can mix and match them. But in general, the thing that we're interested in, the, the item of consideration, the item of interest, we typically put on the Y axis. So what we're saying here is, hey, we want a scatter plot where profit graphically is a function of the discount amount. That's why usually you do one on X and one on the Y, but generally speaking, it doesn't actually really matter. But, you know, if you want to sound cool and you want to be able to use terms like the function of, now you know. Okay, so if I run this, what we can see here is our scatter plot. And we can see that profit goes down, right? Negative profit is associated, very highly associated or very highly correlated with discount amount, at least based on our data. So what we can see here is, hey, when our discount amount is zero, we get the highest amount of profits that we can see by these dots here. Now, it's not perfect. We do see some losses. But in general, we see a very strong word downward trend, which tells us that, at least based on this data set, the more discount we offer, the less profit we make. So that's super interesting, not surprisingly. But we, one of the things we can do to make this pop is we can add a trend line. So I'm going to copy and paste this time. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna import yet another function for plot nine called geom smooth. And this is a function that allows you to add or layer on top of your scatter plots various types of lines. And what we're gonna do is a classic trend line, the kind of thing that you might see in Power BI or Tableau or most commonly in Microsoft Excel, okay? And this is actually pretty easy to do. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna go ahead and add a geom smooth. So we wanna add it on top of our points. So we put it on after our call to geom point, which is our canvas type, our painting type for scatter plot. And what we say here, hey, is we want method LM. And that stands for linear model. And not to get super technical on you, but generally speaking, most trend lines that you see in the real world are linear regression models. Or linear models. So we say, hey, we want an LM because that's what most people expect. 
SC stands for standard errors. We don't really care about that in this particular case. That's why we're setting to false. And I'm going to make the color of the line blue just so that it pops a little bit. Now, if I run this, I'm actually going to get an error. And the reason why I get an error is pretty simple. The LM in GM Smooth says, look, I don't know what X is. You, you, I don't know what's going on here. How do I build the actual LM? How do I build the linear model, the trend line? Because you haven't done an aesthetic mapping for my Geom Smooth. Now, what we could do is we could add a mapping directly right here. So we could do something like this. Oops, that's not right. Hold on. Copy, paste. So we could do a mapping right here. But what's better is if we actually do the mapping at the very beginning. So we can actually tell ggplot when we're building the entire painting, I wanna create one global mapping. I wanna map the paints for every layer, for every aspect of the visualization. I just wanna do it once at the very top. So when I do this, this mapping, this aesthetic, is reused by Geom Point and Geom Smooth. Now, of course, you can override this. You could define a mapping on Geom Smooth, and it would not look at this high-level one. Geom Point would use it, but Geom Smooth would not in that case. But generally speaking, that's very rare that you actually do that. Usually what you can do is create a mapping at the very highest level, and then everything's using it. That's by far and away the most common use case. So if I didn't type anything incorrectly, yay, here we go. And now we can see here is our blue trend line, which very clearly shows that based on the data, as discount amounts increase, our profits go down. This is very powerful evidence. It's not necessarily causal. It's not necessarily the smoking gun, but it is very, very suspicious that we are probably shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of profitability by using discount amounts too liberally with our largest resellers in the U.S. and Canada. So categorical data is super, super common in real-world business analytics and data science. It just is. So I actually spend quite a bit of time using categorical visualizations, probably more often than actually numeric visualizations, to be absolutely honest with you. And what I'm going to show you here is a common technique that allows me to transform numeric columns into categorical columns to help facilitate my visualizations and my visual data analysis. So first thing we're going to do here is we're going to say, look, we're going to add a, whoa, excuse me, add a true false feature to the data frame. Let's capitalize that so it's correct. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, large resellers, we want to change you. And as we talked about in the last video, part 14, it's good coding practice when you're working with pandas is to treat your data frames as immutable. That is, create a copy of your existing data frame and then actually change or alter that copy. And in this case, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my original data frame. And then what I'm going to do is use the assign operator, the assign method, which creates a copy of the large resellers, and then I manipulate that. And what I'm going to do is create, whoa, I didn't spell that proper, profitable. So I'm going to create a true-false categorical feature called profitable. And this is just going to be populated with a very simple piece of logic, which is go to the large resellers data frame, check out the profit column, and if it's greater than zero, Give me a true, or otherwise give me a false. And then this in-memory copy that has the profitable column added, I'm then going to overwrite the existing one. So I'm going to essentially replace the existing large resellers with the large resellers with the addition of this new profitable column. And trust me, if you're not familiar with these things, you might think, geez, Dave, that seems like a lot of extra rigmarole for no benefit. Trust me, treating your data frames as immutable is a good thing. And it's not just me, the pandas um, team would also tell you that as well. Okay, so now I have this new profitable column. And what that allows me to do is incorporate this idea of profitability into my categorical visualizations, which is really, really awesome. So I do this all the time in all kinds of ways. This is how I take numeric columns, turn them into binary indicators, or I might actually segment them, for example. Maybe I would do them in quartiles. So I would say one, two, three, and four, to understand whether it was a first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, so on and so forth. And this allows for a lot of really cool stuff. 
Because realistically, when it comes down to it, as we'll see here in a second, you're there's only so many ways you can slice and dice numeric columns simultaneously. And Plot9 actually provides you great ways of actually using many, many features simultaneously as long as they're all categorical. So this is a great technique to use when you're doing your in data visualizations and data explorations and your analysis. Okay, enough of the hard sell. <laughs> okay, so from Plot9, we're going to import GeomBar. So GeomBar is the painting type, the layer for bar charts, which is your de facto standard way of visualizing categorical data. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, look, we already know that promotion type and discount amounts tend to be kind of a problem for us, for our largest resellers in the U.S. and Canada. So let's actually take a look at profitability in a more intuitive way. This is the kind of visualization that I tend to find that business stakeholders, for example, find a lot more approachable than something like this. So. What we can do here is, once again, ggplot. We're going to go ahead and do large resellers. We're going to go ahead and theme bdub. And we're going to add a geom bar. And of course, we need a mapping. And we're going to do an aesthetic. And we're going to say, hey, look, grab the promotion type paint and use that to paint the geom bar. Now, what's really cool is I can also fill the bars. I created this profitable column, which is true and false. So what I can do is I can say, hey, you're going to go ahead and use promotion to paint the bar, essentially how high, how high the bars are for each type of promotion. And now what I'm going to do is say, hey, within the bars, use profitable to paint each bar. Whoop. What I do is I need to say, hey, fill each bar based on the profitable paint. And then, of course, we can do theme, figure size equals, once again, we'll do 10 inches wide and 6 inches tall. And that looks pretty good. Promotion type, my bad. Voila. Now, this is the kind of visualization that I find way more way more approachable by a broad audience. Because what we can see here is we have our various promotion types. Discontinued product, excess inventory, new product, no discount, seasonal discount, volume discount. And the bars are color-coded based on profitable. And notice these are counts. So what we can see here is that this bar dominates with, what, well over, say, 24,000. So there are 24,000 individual sales order line items in our data set for our large re resellers in the US and Canada. And what we can see here is that the vast majority have no discount on the line item and a certain percentage of them, this coral color here, are not profitable, but most are. And then what we can see here is that volume discount is a little closer to 50-50, little bit on the um, proportion side of being profitable. And then we can see here new products and discontinued products and excess inventory. These all look like they're basically unprofitable. And seasonal discount looks like it's prof profitable. So this is a much more approachable visualization from what I, from based on my experience. So this is one way that you can start visualizing your numeric columns vis-a-vis -vis your categorical columns. But here's the thing. This is based on counts. Sometimes you want to look at proportions, right? You don't really want to necessarily think just about raw counts because you have to kind of eyeball the proportions here. So we can very easily do proportions instead. So all I need to do is grab my code here, control C, control V, as proportions. And now all I have to do is add a new parameter here to my geom bar. And this says, look, I want to change how you paint the bar chart. And instead of using counts, if I tell it to use fill, what it's gonna do is give me proportions. So if I run this, now I get proportions. And this is super important because notice here that all the bars are the same height, and this is 1.0 or 100%. And what I can tell here, here's my 50% line, and what I can see here is, well, my seasonal discounts are in fact all profitable, my volume discounts are just barely above 50% profitable, 
And my no discounts are around, let's see, we'll call this about 70% profitable. And this is a very, very useful visualization. People tend to like this a lot. The only problem with it is, is that all of these bars are exactly the same height, right? Because notice here that these are completely unprofitable, right? So if you look at this visualization, there's a lot of corals, a lot of red color here. People are like, whoa, what's going on? And that's totally, totally unreasonable. But what you also need is you also need to know the counts to realize, okay, yes, maybe 100% of new products and excess inventory and discount product promotion types are unprofitable. But generally speaking, they are just a minuscule amount. So yes, they're unprofitable, but the bulk of our actual sales are right here. So typically what I need is both. So I strongly advise you to always start with a count bar chart and then move into promote, uh, proportion bar charts later on if you need to, because this tells you where the center of gravity of your data is. And obviously it's right here. This stuff doesn't really matter all that much. Okay. At least in terms of counts. We haven't actually looked at dollar, dollar amounts, <laughs> but at least in terms of counts anyway. Okay. So... Categorical visualizations with Plot9 are your bread and butter for analytics and data science. They really, really are. And here's the reason why, because we're going to actually use something known as a facet grid. And what this allows us to do is to incorporate multiple paints, multiple columns, multiple features simultaneously and build much more powerful data visualizations. So we can say, hey, from Plot9, I want to import a function called facet grid. And this facet grid is going to go ahead and look at a number of things simultaneously. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to create a multi-dimensional, nope, didn't spell that correctly, dimension, dimensional, yep, visualization. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab this code up here, control C, control V, and I'm going to modify it. So what I'm going to say here is, okay. I'm actually not going to do proportion chart. I want to do counts. My fill is going to be profitable. My bar chart is actually not going to use promotion type anymore. It's actually going to use product category. Because now what I'm trying to find out is, okay, look, I know that certain things are profitable and certain things are not profitable. So in terms of promotion type. So what I want to know is, for example, does this change based on what country we're in? Canadian resellers versus U.S. resellers? Does it change by product category? And the easiest way to start looking at stuff like this is just to put them all these all these columns, all these paints in the same visualization, same painting. So next what I do is I say, okay, I'm going to actually facet first. I'm going to say, look, before you create the geom bar, I want you to segment the canvas into a bunch of tiles, if you will, a bunch of quadrants, a bunch of squares. And how I want you to define the squares is the intersection of promotion type by country region name. So what this is going to do is it's going to say, look, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six types of promotions here. And I've got my country region is going to be, oops, country region name is going to be Canada and United States because we're only looking at those two particular countries. And we'll create essentially a row for every unique promotion type. One, two, three, four. So create six rows and then create two columns because I know I have two country and region names, Canada and US and United States. And then lastly, within each one of those squares, each one of those tiles in the visualization, create a bar chart of product category and fill it by profitability. So that's all a bit abstract. But once we run this code, it starts to become way, way more Interesting. And this is a little squished. So what I actually need to do is make my height a little bit bigger. So I'll make my height 12 and it makes it a little easier to read. And let me just zoom out a little bit here just so it's easier to see the entire visualization. Okay. Notice I got my two columns, Canada and the United States. So these are all the Canadian data and this is all the United States data. And then you can see here my individual promotion types. And then lastly, we can see the product categories down here. So accessories, bikes, clothing, components. So this is great. And what we can see here is that volume discount 
for U.S. and Canada, eh, not particularly big in terms of counts, in terms of sales order line item counts. Same with seasonal discount, not surprisingly, no discount. But what's interesting is what we can see here is that for bikes, this is obviously the tallest bar, well, the second tallest bar, I should say, for the U.S., and it's way taller than for Canada. And notice that this bar is almost... No, it's actually a little over. It looks like it appeared to be a little over 50% unprofitable for bikes in the U.S. And what we can see is more of a 50-50 split. And what we can see here is that components is the tallest bar for the U.S. And it's overwhelmingly profitable. So that's super interesting. Now, notice once again, we're not talking about dollar volume. We're just talking about counts. Okay, That would be the next thing that you would look at. And you can take that as homework after this video if you'd like. Okay, So this is a really, really super powerful visualization. And it shows you something that I do all the time in my real world analytics. I use facet grids all the time because what I want to do is I want to combine multiple features at the same time, multiple paints at the same time. And what, check this out. I'm looking using one, two, three, four columns simultaneously in this visualization, but you don't have to stop there. I've actually created visualizations like this using six columns. I'm not going to do that in this video because what ends up happening is that you usually need a pretty good sized monitor to see it because the visualizations are kind of big, but six way visualizations using FASA grids, totally, totally doable. And this is part of the reason why categorical data is really, really super useful. Even transforming numeric data into categories allows you to do stuff like this, which is super awesome. Okay. Now, inevitably people are like, well, Dave, this is great, but I want to use this like in a PowerPoint or something like that. And I need to put labels on it. Okay. So let's show you how you can do some labels here. No problemo. So we're going to go ahead and add another cell down here. We're going to copy and paste our code in. And then from plot nine, we're going to go ahead and import labs, which stands for labels. So this is an easy way to add labels to your visualizations. So what I can do here is I can say, hey, I'm going to put my labs in right here. Technically, I could put this after theme. doesn't really matter. Labs. And I'm going to say, hey, here's my title. And it is multi-dimensional bar chart. And what we can see here in this visualization is, is that my x-axis is already labeled here, product category. So what I'll do is I'll just add a y-axis to show you how you do that. Not surprisingly, it's just Y, and we'll say this is um, promotion type. And if I run this, I forgot my plus here. Now we can see promotion type is added. I've got my title at the top. Generally speaking, you can label your plot nine visualizations six ways from six ways from Sunday, any way you would like. It's beyond the scope of this video to cover all that. So what you're going to want to do is Google it or use ChatGPT to help you out with that. Okay. All right. Next up, let's talk about how you can export your visualizations. So a common thing I do with my Plat9 visualizations is I incorporate them in other artifacts. I certainly use them in, for example, my Jupyter Notebooks for my own work. But oftentimes what I need to do is present them to other people either in like a Word doc or more commonly in a PowerPoint presentation. So being able to export your visualizations is actually quite handy. So what I'm going to go ahead and do here is show you how to do that. So we're going to go ahead and export this very last visualization as a PNG file. And yes, other file formats are supported like JPEG, things like that. But more often than not, you're using PNG. And the easiest way to do this is just to grab my code here. Whoops, didn't get it all. Control C, Control V. And what I'm gonna need, what I'll need to do here is just simply call save. Because what all this code does here in between these parentheses is create a object, a ggplot object, a plot, if you will, a plot object in plot nine. And I can invoke methods on the result of that. And one of those is save. This is a very easy thing to do. And I can just specify my file name. I can say, hey, I'm going to call this my bar chart.png. And what I can do is I can also specify the resolution. So DPI. 
And I'm not going to be able to go into DPI. That's a whole different thing. Once again, you can Google it or chat GPT it. But what I'm going to do here is set my DPI to be 300. And if I run this, you get some information coming back from Plot9 saying, hey, I'm saving out a 12, 10 by 12 image, and the file name is my bar chart.png. By default, this is going to be written, this PNG file will be produced in the same location where your notebook resides. And what I can do here is show you the visualization, just to prove to you that, sure enough, it's created as a PNG file. And here you go, you can see it right here. So this is great. And there you have it. Very much a crash course in Plot9. Now you know everything that you need to know to start building on these skills. For example, if you start looking at some of my free crash courses on machine learning, I use Plot9 in those as well. And you know enough to totally follow along with any of that stuff. All right, congratulations. You've reached the end of my Python crash course. If you're interested in understanding what's next, I have some free machine learning crash courses. So you can take your Python knowledge now that you have and start expanding it into actual real world analytics and data science use cases. And what we can see here is I have a crash course on logistic regression, one on decision trees, one on tuning decision trees. You should really watch these two together and one on cluster analysis. And these crash courses are 100% free. They're on demand. You watch them when it's convenient for you. And you also get a PDF of all the slides. You get all the data. You get a notebook, Jupyter notebook of all the code, everything that you need to start building your real world machine learning and data science skills. So that's what's next. I hope you've enjoyed this series. By the way, links to these particular crash courses are in the description below the video. All right, that's it. Until next time, please stay healthy and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.